Today is a good day to renew my mind, encourage my soul, align with truth, and walk in faith. Amen. I am so happy to see you this morning. Everybody's looking good. You feeling good? You ready for the word? Awesome. Before we jump into the sermon, we're going to do have a little family meeting. Is that all right? Let's go. Good. Uh, I've had so much family time this week. It's just been amazing church family time this week. On Tuesday night, the guys got together here on campus. And okay, we we learned to be wild at heart. It was a great time. Chris, you were there. It was wonderful. You can vouch for that. Um, by the way, during worship, man, I thought you were about to just take off running, running laps, running laps. I'm like, get, get it, Chris, get it. Anyway, we had, we had a great time. And then yesterday, we were on the hiking group. Who went hiking with the church yesterday? Chris, where, Chris, I'm sorry, you weren't there hiking. Oh, the other Chris. Where? Oh, right, oh, Rosa back there, yes. Yeah, we had a great time. It was a two-hour hike, three miles. Dogs were there. Uh, humans were there. It was just wonderful. We had a great conversation. If you missed it, you really missed it. We had such a, a good time. I'm just ready to continue our family time this morning with a little conversation. Actually, it's not just a conversation. I, I want to hear from you, okay? So it's not just me giving what I have. I want to know what's inside you over the next few minutes. So our worship hosts are going to do me a favor and very rapidly, rapido, we are going to hand out surveys. These are anonymous surveys. We're going to fill it out together right now. We're going to just take the time during service to fill this out because I want to make sure and collect it from everybody. Now, if you're a first time guest, welcome to the Exchange Church. Please fill this out. It's helpful. Um, this is this is not to make you feel like you've been tested this morning. It's so that Carrie and I and the leadership here at the Exchange Church can better meet the needs of our congregation. Now, I could just ask you all these questions individually. We could form a long line after church and I could one by one go through it. But I think it would just be better and quicker if you just fill it out right now. Is that all right? Could I, could I get one of those? Um, also, a few more volunteers. You see there's a bottleneck. Just jump up and let's get these out. Thank you, ma'am. Oh, it is double-sided, yes. It's one per person, age 13 and up. 13 and up. I'll read that top paragraph for you. If you need pens, I think we have some pens as well. Just raise your hand if you need a pen. Do we have pens? Okay, can, can we get multiple people with pens? Yeah, just take charge. If you're a volunteer, just take charge. Just get the people what they need as quickly as possible. I'll read that top paragraph. We want to take inventory of the congregational health at the Exchange Church. Your honest, everybody say honest. Your honest responses will help us meet the immediate needs of our church body. We hope that every teen and adult will complete the survey. Please only complete one survey per person. Don't throw off our numbers with 10 submissions, okay? And by the way, I made it anonymous because I don't want you to feel the need to impress anybody. I just, I just want your honest feedback. You can fill out the top census data. Are you male? Are you female? You can fill out your age. Are you a follower of Jesus? Yes, no, not sure. Even if you're not a follower of Jesus, please take this survey. If you're not a member of the church, please take this survey. You just turned 13 yesterday, please take this survey. For those that are watching online, you can grab one of these on campus at the Exchange Church and fill it out. 
and return it to us in the offering barrels or at the information desk. I will have these available over the next three to four Sundays, so anyone that did not fill it out can fill it out. Once you fill it out during this month, you don't need to fill it out again. So if you're in the room, you can ignore me right now. I'm just going to talk to our online congregation. What's Oh, the fasting. So for, if you're watching at home, just so that you know what the people in the room are doing, there are a few questions. I've asked them what their home environment is best described as. If there is spiritual and relational unity, maybe there is spiritual unity, but not relational unity. Maybe there is relational unity, so they get along great but they're not spiritually headed in the same direction. And then maybe there is spiritual and relational disunity. That is helpful for us to know as a congregation. I then go into a series of questions on spiritual disciplines. The first spiritual discipline I address is fellowship. Uh, fellowship happens on church campus and online as well face-to-face -face interaction heart conversations the opportunity to uh, sow into each other not just to receive but to also pour into another person that is fellowship so I'm asking them how often they attend on-campus church and if they're not on campus how often do they watch online that's helpful for us to know I then go into a question on the spiritual discipline of Bible study. How often do they read the Bible? The top answer is I read the Bible daily. And then the next answer is I read the Bible three to six times a week. Um, I know for some of the perfectionists in the room that read the Bible six times a week, you're going to be frustrated that you're grouped in a category with those that only read three times a week. Then I read one to two times a week. And then there's the answer of less than weekly or never. That's just very helpful for us to know. I then go into spiritual disciplines of prayer, the spiritual discipline of giving, the spiritual discipline of fasting, the spiritual discipline of serving, and the, dis the, dis the discipline of discipleship. Discipleship, incredibly important. When Jesus left this earth, his final command was to go and make disciples, make disciples. On the back of the page, there is a back side to this. I ask them to select all the fruit of the Spirit that function extremely consistently. You're not perfect. You're not perfect in this, but it's pretty evident that this trait is at work in your life. Go ahead and check mark that. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and punctuality. <coughs> Punctuality is not a fruit of the Spirit. It is at the exchange. <laughs> then I have a series of questions asking what they currently struggle with. I currently struggle with, and there are so many options. There's, it's like a buffet. There's something for everyone there. And if your current struggle is not listed, I even give you the option to say other And then finally, I asked them which sermon topics would they find helpful or most interesting, and I've listed several. They're only allowed to choose their top three. They can't choose 10 or four or all of them. 
You could choose only one. You can choose only two. But no more than three. Top three choices of sermon topics. I'm going to give you about 60 seconds longer to complete this form. If you don't think that's long enough, would you please just wave at me? If you don't think 60 seconds is long enough, there's a couple, couple of people, okay? How many are done with the survey? Wonderful, then let's move on. Those who are not yet done, you can turn them in at any point, but here's what I'm gonna ask. Um, how should we collect these? We could pass them down, uh, but then the neighbor's gonna be nosy. You don't think so? I just feel like church people are the nosiest people. You can, you can lay it at the stage or pass it down. We'll have worship post collect it. Just raise it in the air. We'll collect it. We will get it collected somehow. If you are done, throw it up in the air. Thank you so much for your participation. You know church folk. They are nosy. <laughs> Got to be knowing everything so I can pray about it. Again, if you're still working on yours, take your time. Please turn it into the info desk at the end of service, um, or you can leave it in your seat if you'd like, or you can turn it into this barrel here. I want to begin a new series. I'm kind of excited about this series that I'm going to kick off today. Uh, I, I just think there are some points in Scripture that often get overlooked, and so in this series, we're going to kind of highlight those smaller details that have a big impact. The, the name of my series is And Then. And Then. You ever heard someone telling a story and they stop at an awkward place and you're like, and then? <laughs> Do you know? There's, there's this movie. Was say, and then? And then. <laughs> no, nothing else. Just, just the chicken and the beef and the three bowls of rice and then yeah it's it's crazy it's in youtube you can search and then and it's a great clip i was going to play it but i felt like that was a bit sacrilegious um but the series title is and then okay and then i'm going to discuss and look at several big things that happen in scripture but because of how big that thing is we often forget what happens next like the really cool details that are on the heel of the big thing right so we just came out of easter resurrection sunday last week and the title of my sermon today is jesus rose from the grave and then very cool i'm excited to talk to you about what jesus did right after the big crescendo of raising from the grave will you stand with me as we read our text today We're going to go to Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 32. Okay, this is Luke 24, 1 through 32 in the New King James Version. It says, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and, and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. They, then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. <laughs> and they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other 
women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales. And they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb. And stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves. And he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. Now, behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained, so they did not know him. And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another another as you walk and are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened here in these days? And he said to them, What things? So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priest and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us, certain, and certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Then he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets had spoken, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Do not, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road, and while he opened the scripture to us? Father, we come before you today. God, I thank you for your word that is alive and active and God, I ask that you would just stir in the room today. Let your word come alive to us. Help us to, God, just grow from this moment together with you. For any shame that is in the room, God, I ask that you would help us to release it now. Any fear that is in the room, help us to release it now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, I pray. Let the church say... Amen. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, and then it gets good. (laughs) I want to show you an oil painting that many of you may have seen before. I brought it with me today. This oil painting is the most famous picture of Jesus ever. It is pre-World War II by Warner Solomon. Do we have that photo? Warner Solomon. How many recognize this picture of Jesus? Really? That's all? Okay. Let me just, again, maybe some of you are like, he's not really going to count the hands. How many of you recognize or have seen this picture of Jesus? Okay, okay, very good. Some of you, some of you still have not. It's surprising. Uh, it's surprising to me because this is the most famous picture of Jesus that has ever existed. There are 500 million reproductions, 
500 million reproductions of this photo if you include all the candles, lampshades, calendars, and magnets. Uh, there, is, there is a lot of serene Jesus looking off in the distance. It's captivating. He's staring at something. I want to know what he's looking It is the most reproduced image of Jesus in world history. So it's kind of a big deal. Happened only in 1941. So not actually that long ago for it to have gained so much traction and to be as world renowned as it is. Um, if, if you grew up 2000 years ago, though, you would notice something about this photo that felt a little bit off. <laughs> Okay, um, th I will tell you that this image, can we show that one more time? Because this image really shapes how most people think about sweet Jesus. Um, approachable, kind, clean hair, uh, newly bathed, maybe some hair products, some, a little bit of oil or lotion in there. Um, spiritual Fabio good one. Uh, you, when you think of Jesus looking at that picture, you just think, man, that guy's good. That's just a, a good guy. Now, uh, we're, we've been a little bit conditioned to think that, you know, that looks like Jesus. But if you had lived 2,000 years ago, there would be a striking feature that's obvious then, maybe not so obvious now, uh, and that is that Jesus looks like a freshly showered, very handsome, um, white European. <laughs> he looks French. I can almost hear him, Como vous appelez -vous? <laughs> I mean, that's, he, he's handsome. Um, but in 2002, a group of British New Testament scholars teamed up with forensic scientists and did a tour around Jerusalem and gained access to skeletons and skulls and, and the framework of bodies that actually lived in the time that Jesus lived in, dating back to that time. And they did scans and they reconstructed the face of an average Jewish man. So there is a photo that has surfaced based on that discovery and that work, that educational work. And many scholars now lean toward the fact that Jesus probably looks something a little more like this. Much different than the first picture that we saw. Uh, but this is what uh, the, the shape contour was mostly like, not saying that this is Jesus. Let me just make that clear but it is probably closer to the true image of Jesus than the first one we saw by Warner Solomon. Okay, this one actually looks like a Jewish man of 2000 years ago. At this time, uh, their average height was the mid fives. So Jesus was likely five foot six. Hard to believe. I know you pictured Jesus taller than you, didn't you? you oh yes, Jesus, but more likely, yes, Lord. Uh, probably five, six, most likely had coarse black hair, had a larger nose for all of us in the room, like me with little bigger hunkers. We're like, Hey, Jesus had one too, a little bigger nose. Um, now question while you're looking at the photo, this last photo of, of Jesus, I want you to ask a question to yourself. Don't raise your hand, but just answer this in your own mind. Would you put this picture up in your house? Can you imagine buying a candle with that mug on it? <laughs> the apocalypse, you run out of electricity and you go and light 10 of those candles? <laughs> Am I the only one that thinks like... I think I like pretty Jesus on the candle when I'm in a closet thinking a tornado is coming rather than that guy. That, 
Fat guy says, get ready. <laughs> right? The other Jesus is like, it's okay. But what? why would we want a false image of Jesus in our home more than an image that more accurately looks like probably who Jesus actually was? Now this underscores, this little illustration just really lets us understand that the way we perceive someone, the way we perceive them drives how we think about them. That first photo, I think Jesus is sweet. That second photo, I can, I can now see him flipping some tables. That, that first photo, I can see him at the Last Supper, breaking the bread, sharing the wine. But that last photo, I can see him casting out devils. I, I, I can just, I, on the second photo, I can just see a man who became like us to rescue us. Not to be GQ on the cover of a magazine, European Jesus looking good with a nice French accent, but a real Jesus who left his abode in heaven, became flesh so that you and I could be reconciled to God. That second picture, man, that Jesus could take some stuff. That Jesus did take some stuff. For just a week ago, 10 days ago, he was scoured, he was beaten. Planks driven through his wrist and his feet, a spear piercing his heart, his water gushed out. That Jesus is fighting for you. That Jesus is fighting for your marriage. That Jesus is fighting for your sanity and your health, your physical health, your mental health, your financial health. I want second Jesus. I, I wanna get a glimpse of Jesus that isn't just sitting on a shelf pretty somewhere, but a Jesus who's willing to get dirty in life circumstances and willing to fight for you and I. I really love, I love what Jesus did after he rose from the grave, the and then. He rose from the grave and then. He rose from the grave and then he allowed us to rediscover him. The new him, the victorious him, the risen him. I don't know if you caught this news article from Dateline Jerusalem. I'm going to read it to you, I, just word for word, if that's right. On the eve of the annual celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the one, millionth in, the one million inhabitants of the city were shocked by the announcement that a body identified as that of Jesus, was found in a long-neglected tomb just outside the boundary of the city. Rumors had been circulating the last week that a very important discovery was about to be announced. The news, however, far, far outstrips all of our wildest guesses. The initial reaction of Christians here and around the world has been one of astonishment, bewilderment, and defensive disbelief. We will have to wait and see just what effect this discovery will have on the 2,000 year old religion. To the mind of this unbelieving writer, it appears that Christianity will have to take its place on the same level with the other religions of the world. No longer can its followers claim that unlike other religions, the tomb of its founder is empty. Evidently, a 2,000 year old lie has come to an end. You likely didn't read that article because that article is not real. That's not an actual article. That discovery was never made. But can I ask a question? As you heard that article, did any of you stop? Did your heart just kind of stop and wonder what's going on? They found the body of Jesus on the outskirts of town in a tomb. 
that article, just to repeat, so this isn't taken out of context, that article was never written. It is not true. It is total rubbish. I repeat, it is not a real article. But if such an article were true, if what I just read was indeed found to be a matter of indisputable fact, then according to the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you and I are believing a lie. So as I read the article, there maybe should have been a bit of trepidation because there's a lot on the line. There is a lot on the line with an empty tomb. We are believing in vain if they found the body of Jesus. All of our sins are still intact if they found the body of Jesus. We haven't been cleansed from a thing if they found the body of Jesus. But the fact of the matter, we're, what, we're talking facts this morning, the fact of the matter is that we have eyewitness accounts of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Eyewitness accounts from secular historians who don't have a dog in the fight. Josephus, not a believer, the most well-known historian of that time, wrote of the accounts of Jesus after his resurrection going and presenting himself to many people. There are documented eyewitness accounts of Jesus being risen from the grave. Now, speaking of Jesus rising from the grave, I want to give you today four credentials of Jesus that set him apart as completely unique. We come on the tail end of the resurrection, the cross, the resurrection, and then we learn something very profound about this Jesus. There are four things that set him completely apart from anyone else. Number one, his impact on history. His impact on history, the kind of influence, the kind of impact, the kind of footprint that Jesus left. Though many people have come and challenged and changed and influenced the world, no one has changed the world like Jesus. Not a one. He was here 33 years in total, three years of active ministry, and no one in all of human history has impacted planet Earth like Jesus Christ. His legacy, his impact on history sets him apart from anyone else on planet Earth. Can I get a witness in the room? The second thing that sets Jesus apart as unique is fulfilled prophecy. Hundreds of predictions or prophecies were made in the Old Testament, uh, just over 300 actually, hundreds of years before they were ever fulfilled. Before Jesus was ever born, prophets gave prophecies of his coming, of the coming of the Messiah. Uh, Jesus fulfilled every single one. If you remember two Sundays ago, we talked about how he went to get a donkey to ride on a donkey. That was to fulfill one of the prophecies. It, he could have walked into Jerusalem, but he fulfilled the prophecy, every last prophecy, over 300 of them. That sets him apart from anyone else on planet Earth. There's a third thing that sets Jesus apart from anyone else, and that's the resurrection from the dead. There are many religions in the world, and every religion in the world, except for four, every other religion in the world are based upon postulates, uh, the philosophies, philosophic, philosophical postulates, uh, presuppositions um, of its founders. O only four of them, four religions in all the religions that exist, only four of them are based upon personalities or people. Those four religions are Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Four major world religions that are based on a person. Those are the only four that are based on a person or a personality. Of those four that I just listed, though, only one claims and maintains has yet to been disproven by any number of people that would love to disprove it. 
Only one maintains the resurrection from the dead, the defeat of death itself by the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what separates Christianity from any other world religion, the resurrection from the dead. And then finally, the final point that separates Jesus from any other God, any other religion, is the thing that we see happen after the resurrection. The thing that we see Jesus do after the cross, after the resurrection, this is the thing that sets him apart. Point number four is he comes to us. In every other world religion, it is up to you to make yourself right. It is up to you to reach some level of nirvana, to become a godlike person with godlike actions and godlike thoughts. It's up to you to somehow measure up to the God that you worship, but, but not in Christianity. You don't have to strive to get to God. God came to you. That's worth serving Jesus if for no other reason. He's not expecting you to bust yourself to get somewhere. He laid it all down. He left his home in heaven, became flesh. God became flesh, lived a life of perfection with temptation, conquered death, hell, and the grave. And following the big resurrection, I, if I were Jesus, I would have gone to the beach. I would have found a hammock, a good book to read, possibly a multi- sequel scroll like I, I would have I would have spent a long time just recuperating from all the trauma I just went through but very early in the morning not later in the day not after not after brunch very early in the day after he had rescued the world he found a person and came to them. And he found some men and came to them. And he found the 11 and came to them. And he found the 50 and came to them. And he, he found the 200 and he came to them. He was consistently, repeatedly, feverishly finding people to come to. He comes to us. I want to walk through our text as I prepare to close out today and just pull out a few a few things to think about in in Luke 24 the resurrection is described and it says now on the first day of the week very early in the morning they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared I love that they're bringing spices. These women are bringing spices to a tomb that they think is closed. There's a, a bit of cognitive dissonance here going on because they're bringing spices to anoint a body that is closed behind a rock. And I love the fact that love moves us beyond logic. They were just so in love with Jesus. They were so in love with honoring him that they didn't even take into account that we're not going to get to touch his body. We're not going to get to see him. He's, he's in a tomb covered by a rock, but they brought the spices anyway. Love will move you to do things that sometimes don't make sense. To love people that can't love you back. To show up for people that won't show up for you. Hi, you scared the mess out of me. <laughs> Have you been there the whole time? thought I was about to get taken out. <laughs> I really did. <laughs> don't get me wrong. I'm not afraid to die. I just don't want to die now. <laughs> okay. Okay. Verse 2, but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments, <laughs> angels, 
Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. Now, when we take into account all the gospel accounts of what happens when Jesus rises from the dead, it can get a little bit like a, a jigsaw puzzle and you're not really sure what piece goes where and you have to kind of lay it out on the table and fit it all together. Uh, we propose that the first, very first person to interact face to face with Jesus following his resurrection was Mary Magdalene. She was separated from the other women after the, after the initial visit to the tomb. Uh, it seems that she hastens off to find Peter and the other disciple, which we know is John. The other nine disciples were apparently not with Peter and John that morning and were informed of the empty tomb by the other women. In John chapter 20, verses 1 and 2, it tells us that Mary Magdalene told them the Lord's body was missing. After Peter and John viewed the empty tomb and departed, Mary Magdalene, a woman, remained behind crying. As she's weeping, she saw the angels in the tomb, asked about the missing body, and then had her own conversation with Jesus himself. In John chapter 20, verse 17, Jesus sends Mary off and tells her to tell the other brethren that he is alive and that he is well. In verse 18, we see that Mary obeyed. Okay, right after Jesus rose from the grave, there was a resurrection and then he allowed woman to rediscover him. I think Jesus appeared to a woman first because he was maybe honoris, honoring Genesis chapter three, where it says the enemy will be crushed by the heel from the seed of woman. I think he came out of that grave Jesus, the seed of a woman, came face to face with a woman for this moment of honor. I, I love this subject of women. I hope that a number of you checked it on the back of your survey, women in the Bible and women in leadership. Did anyone actually check that in your top three? Top three, one, one of you did, two of you did. Three of you did, four of you did. What, what's the deal with the slow responses? <laughs> Can I get a five? <laughs> well, the good news for you is I'm already working on a series about women in the Bible and women in leadership uh, because I've had my bus and buttons pushed lately on that topic. Uh, God chose for women to rediscover him first. He set them as a place of honor following the resurrection, the thing that changed the world, then he honored women. There's a lot of confusion about women in the church and women in leadership and women speakers and preachers and pastors and well, are they allowed to cook our food and teach our kids, but they can't teach a man. Well, okay. We see in scripture, I mean, there's just a lot of confusion. We see in scripture, uh, 1 Timothy 2.11, that women should be silent in church. <laughs> be quiet, girls. Uh, fathers and husbands, in Numbers chapter 30, fathers and husbands could overrule any vow made by a woman. My wife committed to a wedding next weekend that I wish I could override. Um, in Exodus 21, fathers could sell their daughters as slaves. Where's Addison? <laughs> Addison and Michaela, you should thank me because I have a right to sell you as a slave. Husbands who were displeased with their wives could send their wives away. Shh. <laughs> it's Bible. I want some banana bread by banana bread by 3 p.m. Banana bread by 3 p.m. 
So the Bible is a bit confusing about women in church and leadership. And I'm gonna break that down for you because all the joking I just did is not really what the Bible says about women. One of the first things Jesus did following the resurrection is he honored women. And as a believer, as a follower of Jesus, one of our top priorities should be honoring women. Verse 13, Christ appears on the road to Emmaus. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? I just think it's funny that Jesus, Jesus, the glorified, resurrected, like know everything, Jesus who built this place comes up and says, hey, what are y'all talking about? Don't play, you know. And then the one whose name was Cleopas answered him. It was Cleopas and another man walking, by the way. Uh, this is just church tradition. It's not fact, so take it if you want. But church tradition is that Cleopas was the uncle of Jesus that he was the brother to Joseph, the carpenter. Um, and then the second person tradition would say is Luke, the writer of this book. So Cleopas and Luke were actually heading away, away from Jerusalem. So they're not actually expecting like this, this, this word of the resurrection, this rumor is actually true. They're headed home. Cleopas, Uncle Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And Jesus said to them, What things? Again, playing coy. So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered to him to be condemned and death, condemned to death and crucified him, but we were hoping that it was he who is going to redeem Israel. They're sad because they were hoping it was Jesus that was going to redeem Israel. That's exactly what Jesus did. That's what the death, burial, resurrection accomplishes. Redemption. Not just for Israel, for anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord. What looked to them like defeat was actually the goal that Jesus had. And they're walking away sad because Jesus did what they wanted him to do, but it didn't look like the way they wanted it to look. They were looking for a European Jesus. Not a five foot six scruffy, dirty Jesus. The Bible says he walked along with them on this stretch of seven mile road and they didn't recognize him. Disciples of his, relatives of his, they had eaten with him, camped with him, learned from him. But on seven miles, we walked three miles yesterday. That took us two hours as a group, probably seven miles walking with Jesus and talking, probably four to five hours. In four to five hours of walking, they didn't recognize Jesus. And they get to Emmaus and they're going to stay. And Jesus, the Bible says it, he pretends as if he's going to go on. Jesus is such a player, man. He knew he wasn't going to go on. He knew what they were talking about. He knew what happened. He knew that he was going to have dinner with them that night, but he just pretend. Sometimes God will make you think he's doing one thing so that you get hungry for him. So you thirst for him. And they begged him to stay. And he stayed and he had dinner and still didn't know who he was. There was a moment at the dinner table where they instantly, their eyes were opened and they knew that it was Jesus. The Bible tells us in verse 31 that their eyes were opened and they knew him. They knew him for what he was. If we back up into verse 30, 
This is the point. This was the turning point where Jesus came to them, made himself known to them. It came to pass as he sat at the table with them that he took the bread, blessed the bread, broke the bread, and he gave the bread. Now, if you read your Bible and you read the story of the dinner before crucifixion, He's with his disciples, and the Bible says that he took the bread, he blessed the bread, he broke the bread, and he gave the bread. This isn't just a dinner moment. This is a moment where Jesus is sharing his nature, where he takes something, and he blesses it, and he breaks it and he gives it. He took the bread, he blessed the bread, he broke the bread, and he gave the bread. Many of you are in that cycle right now where Jesus is coming to you, and he, he takes your situation, he blesses the situation. Then there's a, a moment of crushing in the situation, and then there is a giving. Everything in your life, when God's hand is on it, it will find a season of blessing. You will find a season of breaking where the things that you thought you needed aren't really the things that you need. The goals that you thought you had aren't really the goals that he has for you. And once you come into alignment with his plan and his purpose for your life, he gives you to bless the world. Jesus died on the cross. He was placed in a grave. He rose from the grave. And then he came to you. And he's still coming to you. Will you bow your head and close your eyes this morning? Sometimes in the celebration of high holy days, the grandiose story of a tomb that is now empty. We forget the small details that Jesus is still pursuing you. You may not recognize him in your situation. You may not see where he's positioned or what he's doing. You may not know how you're getting through this point in history but God is making himself known to you. Step by step, mile by mile, dinner by dinner. If you're here this morning and you don't know the Jesus that we're referring to, maybe on the survey you put, you don't, you're not sure if you're a believer, if you're a follower of Jesus, maybe you're not sure. Or maybe you said, no, I'm not a follower of Jesus, but you are ready to make Jesus the Lord of your life. The Bible says that if we believe Jesus is the Son of God, that he died on the cross for our sin so that his sacrifice could make us right before a holy God. And if we believe that he was placed in a grave and on the third day rose again and that tomb is still to this day empty, if we believe that, we are sons and daughters of the King. If you're ready to place your faith in Jesus, if you believe that, will you just raise your hand? No one's looking around. No one's watching you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Four hands, five hands, six hands. Thank you. Seven hands. Thank you. And the hands that are on online in this moment, wherever you are, whether you're watching it live in this moment or six months down the road, now is the time to say yes to Jesus. Church, can you just say with me this simple prayer? It says, Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner. There's nothing I can do to earn my way to heaven. There's nothing I can do to perform well for you. You came to me. 
and I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that Jesus was crucified on the cross for my sin. He took my place. I believe that he was placed in a grave and on the third day rose again. From this moment forward, I say yes to you, Lord. From this moment forward, my life will never be the same. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Can we stand and celebrate this morning? The decisions that were made for Jesus, the Bible says that when one decision is made, all of heaven celebrates. If you said yes to Jesus, I would like you to scan the QR code so that we can walk this journey with you so that you know what your next steps are.